We've already introduced this individual this morning um, as the recipient of the award. Um, I'm happy to do so again. Uh, Jojo Annabeel is attorney in charge at the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society, and he has previously worked as a staff attorney with Society's Immigration Law Unit and the Criminal Appeals Borough. He is currently on the adjunct faculty at the New York University Law School, where he co-teaches a clinic on immigrant defense and he is uh, a champion of immigration rights and we're really lucky to have him here with us today as well. So good afternoon to all of you, and um, I'm hoping that my 30-minute presentation will not put you to sleep. <clears throat> we are talking about immigration arrests and detention, preparation and response. And I believe, just to give you a roadmap of how I intend to uh, do this presentation, basically to look at what is happening today with regard to detention, arrests and detention, uh, who is at risk, why they are at risk, how they come to the attention of immigration authorities, where can you locate someone who is arrested, how do you help this person, how does this person prepare him or herself for a possible arrest and detention, and is that person even eligible to be released from detention. So we'll look at all these things because I believe um, as advocates you may get people who would call you in anguish because they can't find their relatives and it's unnerving sometimes when you don't have information to give to these people. And so I'll try and walk you through the process. I believe in your handbook it's chapter seven that deals with this um, portion of my training and so I'll just be hitting on certain highlights of whatever is in your bulletin. So at the end of 2010, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is the enforcement arm of the Department of Homeland Security, detained approximately 400,000 immigrants nationwide. If you flip back all the way to 96, um, the detention population was about 1,900. In 2005, we were around 32,000, and it's increased ever since then. So who is subject to detention? Who is subject to an arrest by Immigration and Customs Enforcement? Anyone who is not a citizen, anyone who was not born here or in any of the territories, Puerto Rico, Guam, U.S. Virgin Islands, if that person violates immigration laws, Immigration and Customs Enforcement can take that person into custody. Why, somebody would ask, that someone who is deemed to be a lawful permanent resident can be arrested? Yes, it's permanent, but also it's temporary. It's permanent in the sense that you can live here, you can work here, and you can travel and come back. However, if a lawful permanent resident engages in criminal activities or violates any immigration laws, that person can be taken into custody. Then we have people who are here because they've overstayed their visa, and so they are here in unauthorized status. And so immigration can basically, um, if they come to the attention of immigration, they can arrest them and start the process of removing them from the United States. So someone who has an immigration violation who is not a citizen, how does that person come to the attention of ICE? The net is really wide, and if secured communities ever becomes um, law, if, if ever it's implemented in New York State, we would even have a wider net. So anyone who comes into contact with law enforcement it could be just a simple domestic violence incident where the person is reported to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the police. It could be that the person applied for some immigration benefit and was denied the benefit, easily adjustment of status. These days, after the appeal process, the person will be placed in removal proceedings. 
And depending on what happens, that person could be taken into custody. A lot of times we see this people being taken into custody because they are here without authorization. Either they've overstayed their visas, either they walked across the border or came into the country with someone else's passport, or people who have criminal convictions. And as a result, immigration takes them into custody. Sometimes it's also chance encounter. So for example, ICE goes into 55 Lexington Avenue looking for John Brown because John Brown has a removal order and has not left since 1995. And John Brown is not available when they hit the doorbell on apartment 4B. So the officers decide to knock on the door or ring the bell for apartment 4C. Why? To ask if they know John Brown and when John Brown usually comes home. But in the process of asking those questions, they also ask, by the way, are you a US citizen? And the president says, no say, no I'm not. And so before you know, there are more questions that follow. And instead of John Brown, it's rather Maria Matos who gets picked up, okay? And all you hear is that someone came from Maria and they are calling you and you are like, what happened? How did they find Maria? Because they knocked on apartment 4A and started knocking on doors and Maria happened to open her door, okay? So that's, also, that's a chance encounters. We are also seeing that a lot with people who have had criminal convictions, have served time, or the judge has ordered them to be on probation. And towards the end of their probationary period, it happens that probation and parole seem to have an agreement with ICE, and so they call in ICE because the person may be subject to deportation. And so you arrive at your pro parole officer's office, and ICE is waiting for you, and ICE takes, takes you into custody. So for example, for a long period of time, we advise clients who are on parole or probation that when their uh, probation officer or parole officer asks them to appear on a day that they are not supposed to be reporting, instead of appearing at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, which is when usually ICE is around, they will stay probably till 10, they go in after noon and give, a, give an excuse why they are appearing after noon and probably bypass ICE. Okay. You, you, you have to be innovative when you're dealing with arrest and detention. How do you prepare for something like this? So we, I've talked about a couple of scenarios. So for example, a lot of times dealing with people who are here without inspection, who are very vulnerable, could be a traffic stop, it could be uh, an argument with their loved one, which turns into a police contact. It's very important that Immigrants gather documents relating to their immigration history. If they've applied for any immigration benefits, you want to have copies what happened. Was there a denial? Uh, were they ever in immigration proceedings? You want copies of that. Why do you need an A number? An A number allows a legal service provider or someone who knows what he's doing around this area to be able to access the Executive Office of Immigration Review, which is the court toll-free uh, system to find out if Maria Matos, for example, has ever been in removal proceedings. Because when someone comes to you, you kind of do a checklist. Is it this? Is it that? Is it that she has a removal or prior removal order? So you, do, you keep checking off the list. It's also good to have a passport because a lot of times you have people who don't want to remain in detention and want to sign out, basically say that I am prepared to leave but the government will require you to have a passport. Sometimes it's good to have a passport, other times it's not good to have a passport. It's good to have a passport for someone who wants to leave, has no relief available. It's not good when, for example, the person may have relief available or for someone who wants to fight his case no matter what, because once you give immigration a passport, one, it identifies you as quote unquote an alien and where you come from, which basically allows them to charge you with being from Mexico or being from Sierra Leone. And it makes it easier for them to get travel documents from your embassy to have you deported. Okay. Um, pending applications, I've talked about that. Um, telephone numbers to consulates. There are some consulates who will go out of their way to help their nationals 
who are in these kinds of situations and probably even get them a lawyer, and so it's also good to have that. So these are things that you always advise clients who basically for us legal service providers, someone who comes to us, that's what we'll do. For those of you who are not lawyers and are basically on the phone te telling someone what to do, these are some of the things that probably the family needs to start gathering together. How do you locate a friend? How do you locate a relative? So for a long time, it was very difficult to do this. You had to make phone calls upon phone calls and nobody would answer. Immigration and Customs Enforcement made this easy about a year ago where basically they have a web page, uh, a web page, an ICE locator system. All you need is the name of the person, the country of origin, and probably if you, are, if you have it, the A number. Once you get into that system, it will tell you if the person has been take, is in custody. Anyone who has been picked up within the last 60 days will be in there or hasn't been released. So it's a good point that you can use for your clients. You can quickly go online. When, even if you're not a lawyer, you can go there. Even if, or you can give this to a relative. I don't know how many of our immigrant uh, clients have computers and can do this. So a lot of times, they're either going to notarios who are going to charge them, or they're going to go to a friend or a neighbor. And if you happen to be the friend or neighbor, this is where you go. You go on the ICE website or just go to Google and Google ICE detainee locator and it will, you, you will be right there. Now, what happens when someone is picked up? In New York, what happens is that once, someone is, once an immigrant is picked up for an immigration violation, the person is processed at 201 Varick Street, which is downtown Manhattan. It used to be a holding facility. It's no longer a holding facility, and they can't hold anyone in that facility beyond 24 hours. So immigrants are processed at 201 Varick Street, and then immigration decides whether they relocate them to four jails outside New York City in New Jersey. We have Monmouth County, we have Bergen, we have Hudson, and then we have Orange County, which is in Goshen, New York. Monmouth is about two, two hours. Uh, Hudson in Kearney, New Jersey is about 20 minutes from here. Uh, Bergen County in Hackensack, New Jersey is about 30 minutes. And Goshen is about an hour and a half, okay? Um, there, are, there is public transportation to Hudson, there's public transportation to Bregan. There is a bus that goes to Monmouth, but then after you get down, you have to do a 10 minute walk. And most visits are for about 30 minutes, but this is all information that you'll get on that ICE locator sign. If it tells you that the person is detained at any of these facilities, they also provide information about the facility. A visiting hours, and um, when you, how to even put money in the person's commissary because uh, when someone is detained, uh, they don't have the same free phone call that you get when you're in criminal proceedings. This is immigration, it's civil. They are forced to buy phone cards, which are very expensive. And so if the person was arrested, just wearing in the summertime, just in shorts and wearing slippers with, and that did not have his wallet with him, tough luck you have to go and look for money and send him money so he, can, he or she can call you. Now, once the person is taken into custody, one of the things that you really are concerned about is this. Can the person be released? Will ICE release the person? There are all kinds of factors that come into this. The factors ICE uses are a couple of factors. ICE basically makes determination whether to release somebody. There are certain people who cannot be released by statute. Congress has dictated that they can't be released. Anyone who is subject to mandatory detention cannot be released from detention. Anyone who is an arriving alien, meaning the person is seeking admission into the country, made a trip abroad, is coming back into the country, has criminal convictions, for example, that makes him subject to deportation, that person is not subject to be released. You can make a parole request, and ICE would make that determination whether to release you. On what basis does ICE do this? ICE looks at, is the person a flight risk? If we release this person, will this person show up in court? 
or will this person flee to Colorado and we'll never see him again? If we release this person, is this person a danger to society? Is this person a threat to national security? I haven't seen that, the third one. I have seen flight risk, possibility. I've also seen danger to community. Now, ICE can do a couple of things if the immigrant can be released. ICE can set bond, which is similar to bail in a criminal setting. ICE can decide to release the person on his own recognizance, meaning that we'll just release you and probably issue the notice to appear. It can also set bond anywhere from 1,500 upwards or set no bond. Okay. So you have someone who comes to you and says, um, my husband just got picked up and I understand he's in Hudson County. I spoke to him and um, he's telling me that the deport officer tells him that he's not, he's not going to set bond in his case. And so what do I do? A couple of things that can be done. An immigration judge, in cases where the person is subject to mandatory detention, cannot do anything about bond. Immigration judge can only do something where, for example, you are eligible for bond, the bond is too high, or no bond has been set. Those are the only circumstances where the judge can do that. The judge can decide either to lower the bond, the, bo the judge can also decide to raise the bond, the judge can also decide to set bond where there's no bond. So for example, in the, in the case I had once where my client was in jail in Bergen County, mother of seven, and bond was at 2,500, and all she had were dismissals where her um, boyfriend's other girlfriend had accused her of hitting her, but they were all dismissed. And I was before a judge and trying to lower the bond from 2,500 to either no bond or 1,500. The judge looks at me once we walk into court and says, Mr. Annabelle, um, if you want to persist in this, I'm going to raise the bond. And I said, okay, judge, I, I think I know where we're going. I think we'll leave it at that. Because I knew the moment I tried, and it, it just didn't seem, it, it wasn't right because she didn't have a conviction. She only had arrests, which were all dismissed. But the judge felt she was a danger to, to community. So she wouldn't, he, he wouldn't give my client a lower bond and would raise it. So it can happen that way, where the judge may decide to raise the bond. Okay. Now, if you go before the judge trying to challenge the bond, because you're saying either the bond was too high or that immigration did not set, set any bond. The burden is on the citizen to show the judge that he or she is not a flight risk, that he or she is not a danger to the community or a threat to national security. When you are in immigration court, anytime someone is arrested, the immigrant's life is an open book. The judge wants to know everything about the person since the person first arrived in this country. You can't hide anything. So you're trying to convince the judge to release you back into society. So you need to show your family ties. Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? Do you pay child support? Do you work? Evidence that you work? Pay stubs? Where do you live? Where's your lease? If you don't have a lease and you're homeless, is someone prepared to take you in? Do you have any criminal convictions? Can we talk about the criminal convictions? Are there issues where, for example, one can say it was an aberration or that you are rehabilitated? Because the judge does not want to see him or her picture um, in the New York, on the front page of the New York Post that they released you and you went and killed four people, okay? So the judge is very cautious ICE is very cautious, and you have to basically be able to advocate, um, the person has to be able to advocate for themselves. A lot of times, their relatives have to do a lot of the legwork. They need to get affidavits from people who know this person, neighbors, attesting to the person's good character, how the person is a loving husband or a loving wife, and what the person has done, work, you need a letter from your employer. How long have you worked with the employer? So you need to show all that to the judge for the judge to make his or her decision. Can you appeal the decision if the judge decides either to raise the bond 
or keep the bond where it is or not to set bond, yes, you have a right to appeal it to the Board of Immigration Appeals. ICE Chief Counsel, which is the side that prosecutes cases, can also appeal that decision. If they appeal that decision, basically what it means is that the immigrant remains in jail until the, the appeal is decided. They won't release the immigrant because the IJ said, I'm setting bond at 1500 and he's willing to pay that bond. You, st you remain in jail whilst the appeal is pending before the Board of Immigration Appeals. The other thing that comes up then is where the judge sets bond or I sets bond, what do you do? You have two avenues. You can pay the bond either in cash or you look for a bail bonds company to put up the money for you and usually they will, they will charge you a percentage. So if you are going to pay yourself, you need to go to ICE, any ICE district office. So for example, if the person is detained in Chicago, you could post the bond here in New York and that would enable the person to be released in Chicago. You need certain information about the individual. You need to know um, the person's name, the A number. You need a copy of the bond um, that has been set by either ICE or the judge. And you need to provide all these to the bond office for them to process it. Because sometimes they have to process the whole thing and be able to call the um, district where the person is being held. If you are the person going to put up the bond, I don't expect someone who is undocumented to show up at an ICE district office and try to post bond. Because that leads almost to double jeopardy because instead of just your husband, now it's your husband and the wife who are in trouble or it's the husband and the brother-in-law who are now in trouble because the brother-in-law tried to post bail. You should not go anywhere near an ICE district office if you're undocumented to post bail or bond, sorry. Because there are certain information that you'd have to provide. You have to show your status in this country. Okay? A driver's license doesn't cut it. Okay? So you need to show your address. You need to show your social security number. You need to show that you have a valid phone number because sometimes they need to call you to tell you that they can't find the person you bonded out. And as a result, they want you to, to um, produce that person within a certain time frame. They need to call you. So they need a valid phone number. Because if they, call, don't, if they call you and you are not able to produce that person, and for example, you used your house as collateral, that house will be in jeopardy, okay? Um, so that, that leads to that. You can use bail bonds company. The bail bonds company doesn't want to, they don't want to lose their money. So they are very vigilant and they set certain terms for um, you so that, for example, if the person misses a court date and immigration starts looking for the person, the bail bonds person is going to come after you, okay, or after the family who put up the money. So in, a, in essence, we're dealing with a situation where detention has really increased, enforcement is an, at an all-time high. And we need to tell non-immigrants who have no status that before, for example, someone calls you and wants to know if he or she should make an application, and the person who is your mentor, who is the attorney, is t you tell the person, and he probably would be telling you to tell the person not to make an application, um, either because it's not the viable application to make or because the press is just not eligible for that benefit. Um, everybody's talking about comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, we haven't seen it come to pass. We thought 2000 was the year, it didn't come to pass. It was like 2007, it didn't happen. So at this point, people are looking for other avenues for um, relief. And the only other avenues that we see currently that are available are things like issues for crime victims, which we see usually when someone is taken into custody. And one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about putting together paperwork or keeping papers so that if someone is taken into custody, it's always important if the person has applied for other benefits because it allows a legal service provider to make determination to see whether the person is eligible for anything. 
it all sometimes happens, for example, that a person may, for example, have been a crime victim, or probably that the person's attorney was ineffective. And so as legal service providers, we are able to probably go and reopen a case that had been deemed dormant and was no longer viable. So these are all things that for someone who is advising anyone in such a precarious position. Because when people are detained, what you have to realize is that a lot of these detention facilities are really criminal detention facilities. A lot of our clients have never been in jail, not even a day. And to suddenly find themselves in a detention facility wearing orange jumpsuits, shackled and chained, and basically um, almost like they've committed crimes and not that they are civil violations, blows people's minds, okay? I've seen people who have aged overnight because of this process. And so it's not, when someone calls you, you should please have patience with whoever is on the other side because a lot of times they don't know what's happening to their loved one or it may be someone who is, has just been picked up and needs help and may be incoherent may have very little time on his card um, to call, in calling you and may call you after that, all you can do is to put the person in contact with a legal service provider who can help him or her. If in doubt, we have a detention hotline at the Immigration Law Unit, operates on Wednesdays, one to five, and it's for detainees and their families. And if I can remember the number correctly, I believe it's 212-577-3456. I believe that's what the number is. If I'm wrong, I'll check in my bag, I'll let you know. But it's, it's, it's a detention hotline that operates Wednesdays from one to five. We take calls. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people can't get through because that is the only one that is available but we try our best to see how to, to address these issues. But if the person can't get through, you can call 212-577-3300, ask to speak to someone in the Immigration Law Unit, and someone will definitely get back to you about uh, this issue or other issues related to detention, okay? Thank you so much.